Hey guys, you're listening to the Money Day Podcast, a podcast that my husband and I launched to help young couples get real about their money. That's right. We'll ask our friends and a few strangers all the uncomfortable and awkward questions about how they handle their money. All the gory details and hopefully a few tips and tricks along the way that you can pick up and use in your own relationship. Welcome to this episode of the Money Date. On today's show, Aditi and I talk with Barry Choi, a Toronto-based personal finance expert. Barry began educating himself about finances when he realized that his financial advisor didn't have his best interests at heart. He's since started a blog, Money We Have, and has been referred to as one of Canada's most trusted sources when it comes to money and travel. Barry talks with Aditi and I about strategies that he and his wife have used to tackle investing, savings, and preparing for a newborn. We had a great convo, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. Thank you, Barry, for joining Aditi and I on uh, the Money Date today to talk with us about uh, about all things finance. Now, you've been in this space for, for a while and have written about it extensively. Why don't you tell us and our audience about how you got involved in personal finance? Yeah, you know, finance was always just like a, a personal interest, but nothing crazy. You know, my parents were immigrants to Canada, so they taught me some very basic things, you know, not spending more money than you make, you know, you try to live on a single income if you can. Uh, And, you know, simple things like saving. Uh, But as far as it comes to blogging is concerned, I really got into it um, after I basically had a bad experience with a financial advisor. And to make the long story short, essentially, not that he was ripping me up, but he wasn't being truthful as, as far as fees were concerned. And once I realized what was going on and called him out on it, I realized that hey, you know what, no one's going to care more about my money than myself, which is mm-hmm. why I kind of started the blog and just started to educate myself and others because I really didn't want them to make the same mistakes that I made. And what was the hardest thing about getting started on that? You talk about educating yourself. I, you know, it, it's funny because it sounds really hard, but now that I'm in the game, it's so easy. It's really just reading a book. Right. Uh, you know what? Yeah, like personal finance, like everyone's like, oh, I don't know anything about investing. I don't know about this. I'm not going to manage my money. But when you actually – start reading a book about personal finance, it's actually really simple. It's really about like some of the things we talked about, not spending more than you make, understanding a budget. And even when it comes to investing, I'm not ex- I'm not a day trader. I don't pick individual stocks, but there's a lot of ways you can invest without being too involved that will still, you know, make you enough money for your retirement. And that's what I'm more interested in. I love that response because, you know, I'm, I'm such a believer that like a lot of financial institutions have made finance feel scary and complicated mm-hmm. so that they can mm-hmm. charge you for services. But really, <laughs> when true. you break it down, it's like basic concepts and basic pieces that people just essentially get scared of because they sound so complicated in the market. Yeah, and that's the thing, like the basic concepts of investing, you know, asset allocation or even understanding what equities and fixed income is. Yeah. Um, you you quickly realize that everything that's talked about in the business world relates to that in the end, Absolutely. right? So, you know, when I'm younger, I can take a little bit more risk because I'm not 40 years away from retirement. But when I'm older, I need to take fewer risks because I'm closer to retirement, you know what I mean? But like once you understand those basic concepts, you're like, oh. That's what they're talking about. Or even after you've read that book, that's what everyone means when I listen to it on TV or on the radio. Right, right. And Barry, you know, t- learning about personal finance on your own, I imagine, was, was you know, you're in complete control. You can handle your own finances. How did that change at all when you got into a relationship uh, with your wife, Carla? And, and how did you even broach the idea of finances? Yeah, as far as relationships are concerned, it's a bit tricky so you know my wife and i are we were together for a long time before we got married and during that time um we're engaged in dating that's where i started to kind of realize how important finance was Mm -hmm. so it's not like i knew to talk about it right away but again it's those basic things you know when i got engaged i knew we need to save x amount of dollars to pay for the wedding that we wanted right Right. so you just did a reverse math okay like you know i'm making this number up right let's just say we're 18 months away and the wedding's going to cost eighteen thousand dollars. That's a thousand dollars a month you got to save. It's that simple, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And as a couple, it shouldn't be too hard if you set those expectations. That means five hundred dollars each if you're doing it evenly, right? So it's something simple like that where it's just like, hey, you know what? If we want to have this wedding, we have to save this amount of money. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't a big issue. Um, the nice thing is also is because I was already learning about finance and, you know, this is my girlfriend, my fiance, she knew I was starting to educate myself. So it wasn't really a weird subject. So it's just something that came up um, as a normal conversation. But the nice thing about these books that I read is they made it very clear that finances is something that you do as a couple, 
You don't mm-hmm. want to get into that mindset where it's like one person controls everything because yep. what happens What happens if I die tomorrow or something that my wife had, would have no idea how to access the money. So I, I made it a point where she should learn also. Um, but the interesting thing is she found a book that appealed to her. Like I had my recommendations, but she found a book that was really spoke to women. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was like, hey, that's great. You found something that works for you. And then if she had any questions, she could just bounce ideas off me. And that's kind of where it all started and led to. That's interesting. What was it about sort of the messaging of that book that, that spoke to her? Is that something that you can you can speak to at all? Yeah, it's something really simple if you think about it. It's, it's the fact that and it's going to sound off of w- women live longer, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's mm-hmm. just a stat, so need to save more money. And unfortunately, right now, we still live in a society where women make less money than men. So they need mm-hmm. to save more on that end too. Uh, you know, there's also the loss of income when they take maternity leave. So there's a lot of things working against women, unfortunately. So mm. it's really just about I have to save more. Got it. And this this book was especially good at highlighting maybe some of those differences and challenges that. Uh, yeah, that exactly. Face. And and talking about it as a couple and the same things we, we were just discussing, how you can't just expect someone else to take care of your money for you. Uh, you know, like I said, if I do, I'm sure a lot of couples, if the partner who manages finances died immediately or wasn't able to pay the bills, they might not have an idea. Like, wow how do I pay the mortgage? Yep. You know what I mean? Like yeah. something simple like that. Absolutely. And I'm actually curious. So do, are you guys the same sort of money personality? Are you guys both savers or spenders or um, a master's? I think I'm a little more frugal than she is. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe a lot more frugal. Um, that being said, I think our personalities have balanced each other out over the years. Over the years, I've become a little bit I don't not necessarily spending more, but more open to spending. Yeah. Um, and same thing, her. I think she's realized that sometimes it depends on the value, right? It's like, hey, you're right. You know, maybe if we don't spend it on this, we can spend it on something else instead. So for us, it's always it's uh, a big thing on it is about experiences for us. We love to travel, so we don't have a problem saving more money for travel, even if that means say sacrificing eating out more or, or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it seems like this open communication between the two of you, as well as uh, a relationship that sort of predated your engagement and, and your eventual uh, marriage, made it easy to talk about finances together and integrating those finances uh, together. Was there anything that was challenging along the way? There's always challenges, right? Like you don't always see eye to eye on everything, on every purchasing decision. You know, I'll still never understand how jeans for women cost $200 plus, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> right. And obviously, I will probably never understand why people need so much makeup and why makeup costs so much. Right? Yeah. It's just something I would just never understand. Um, but that's part of life. You know, like we're saying it, it's a learning experience. Um, but, you, you know, I, I think it's all right. We just the open communication is key. And, and one thing that really opened my eyes is um, before we got married, we took a, a standard marriage course. And then some of the questions they were trying to get the whole point of this course was to get you talking about the the subjects that you may have not talked about before and the finance section was something that we had already discussed so it really was not a problem for us but you could see some of the other couples they were struggling to discuss things and Mm -hmm. it was clear that this was the first time they had even thought about talking about money to each other yeah and you were kind of like oh my goodness like i hope things work out but they got heated, right? You mean yeah. the arguments were just like, uh oh, they they were already in, and this was just the, the first time they were talking about it. You know, one of the goals that we had with this podcast was really to share ideas and ways and strategies for couples to sit down and talk about money and to have the the conversations that feel sometimes difficult, but frankly, uh, can be a lot easier if you're more open to it and feel less anxiety about it when when the topic of money comes up. Yeah, you know, it's it's just the truth, right? Like. Speaking about money is not sexy, right? Like it, it doesn't. It doesn't. I don't ma- know, Barry. Matter. I kind of like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do too. But for most people, you think about they'll talk about anything else. Uh, you know, a good example is like when we bought our home. I, I can't believe how many like you know shades of paint we looked at, or how many coffee tables we looked at, right? right. But like, like you think about the fraction of the time. The reality is more people. Most people spend more time picking their outfit for the day than they do talking about mm-hmm. money for a year. It's just the sad truth. So, you, you know, the point of these podcasts or even my, my website is just to educate people that the money talk is important. Yeah, 
Yep, absolutely. So switching gears a little bit, Barry, you know, what I'm imagining you guys have this like peaceful marriage, you, you've had a great relationship, you've been able to talk about money, and then suddenly Carla gets pregnant, um, and you're expecting a child. Uh, how did how did you guys even go about preparing for your newborn? And how did it change your finances? Well, it wasn't a surprise, surprise, if you know what I mean, like we yeah. had always wanted children. So, you know, it's, it starts way back. So with mortgages, uh, we knew right away, like, listen, the bank actually approved us for a million dollars. And we kind of laughed in their faces, like, I'm a first time home buyer, you want to give me a million dollar home? No, I'm good. Right. So we literally took half that amount because the banks don't factor in the cost of having children, the cost mm -hmm. of signification. So we always had this rough estimate. Uh, this is probably extreme, but we knew it's like, okay, kids are going to cost about X amount. So we should not mm -hmm. buy X house or whatever, mm -hmm. just so we have that buffer. So it was always good. And then, like you said, once you got pregnant, then then the real numbers start coming in, <laughs> right? You yeah. start calculating. Uh, there's a lot of startup costs. I know it sounds weird with a child, but it's true, right? You, we probably spent two to $3,000 just at the beginning, getting everything ready. And there's ongoing exp expenses. Uh, in Canada, my wife was on employment insurance, so she wasn't making her full income. So it's just rebalancing our budgets and making things work. And for the first year, my daughter's now 14 months about, uh, we realized that, you know what? It's not going to be as bad as we thought. We won't have any savings, but we also won't be going into debt. So that's not a bad thing uh, yeah. for the year, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm actually really curious. How did you guys figure out how much a child would cost? Well, they're just estimates, right? <laughs> like, you, Is that what you guys used? Yeah, yeah. You never really know how much a child yeah. will cost. And there's, I can tell you there's there's plenty of surprises. So, you know, you can estimate at the beginning, okay, you know, a crib's going to cost me this much. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, a mattress, diapers, roughly. And then you, you figure out ways to save on those things, you know. Is it worth buying certain items secondhand, like a stroller, possibly? Uh, car seats, you shouldn't because of safety issues. But then other things like diapers. Oh, if I subscribe via Amazon, I can save 20%. Uh, small things here and there. But, you know, there's all these things you don't factor in. Uh, you know, it sounds weird, but, you know, even vaccinations. You know, in, in Canada, a lot of our health care is free, but there are certain optional vaccinations that you got to pay for. Not right. terribly expensive, but at the same time, if you weren't expecting to pay, you know, another $150, for the month, it could ruin your budget, right? right? Um, so so it, there are things like that. Or, or I also joke that, um, you know, every parent will talk about how their kids, you, you know, aren't really sleeping, they're newborns, you're just right. frustrated. Um, I was willing to pay for magic beans at the time if it meant my daughter would sleep. Do you know what I mean? Like, like just, just spending money, <laughs> not like crazy, but it's just like, let's try this, let's try that, anything to get her to go to sleep, right? Right. And so we're talking about spending now, and, and one of the things that, that uh, stood out to Aditi and I that we wanted to ask you about was your maternity spending account. Uh, help us mm -hmm. understand and help our audience understand how that works and how you decide how much to put into it. I think that was something my wife read from that book, to be honest with okay. you, where, where, awesome. where she came up with like the idea, and, and when she brought it up to me, I was like, you know, that's a great idea. Uh, it, was, it was just one of those things where it's just like, you know, when the wife's on maternity, quite often they feel guilty if they're spending money on a coffee or whatever, but that's not fair because, you know, yeah, they're not making an income, but they're taking care of your child, right? It's mm -hmm. like, so what if I'm the one working, if I'm making money, it's still like a joint thing. But she came up, well, she got the idea, it's like, hey, let's start setting aside X amount of dollars every single month, just so she doesn't need to feel guilty when she's buying stuff or, or we're not dipping into any savings. Now, as far as the amount is concerned, I don't remember how we came up with the set amount. But we kind of just estimated, it's like, hey, you know what, roughly I want to spend this much while I'm off, which wasn't a lot if you think about it, because really it's just getting coffee or snacks and lunch, right? Like every so often, but a lot of times she was at home. But we also discussed, it wasn't fair, at least I didn't think it was fair that it was coming out just from her own savings. Mm -hmm. So it's like, no, 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 I should be contributing this account too, even though you're spending it. It's still like a joint thing if you think about it. Right. And, and just to synthesize for our users, a maternity spending account is essentially – a savings account it sounds like that you guys created where you contributed before you got pregnant and before she went off on maternity leave so she had a pool of money to spend from Guilt that's right it's just literally another savings account that was dedicated for maternity funds so so you know we've got set uh, dedicated accounts for vacations for car maintenance uh you know things like that so if you just set aside account automate the savings then it's there when you need it mm -hmm. and that was an account that she solely spent from or did you spend from that as well uh, it was just for her personal spending only. 
Uh, like I said, those coffees, lunch dates were as if anything that was baby related, like diapers or anything else. But we had a separate account set up for that. Got it. Got it. Um, and and so Scarlet's now, as you meant, as you mentioned, over a year old, and and you've mm-hmm. written about how you made more money mistakes than you would have liked, uh, which I love <laughs> because you're you're a personal finance guru. So uh, can you give us <laughs> give our audience a few pointers on what you would redo or or turn back um, if you had the chance? So so the, the one thing I, I laugh about all the time as a personal finance expert is, you know, all the rage was cloth diapers at the time. There's a few other experts who were having babies. So yeah, we're going to buy cloth diapers. It's going to save so much money. And then you realize, and then I had the kid. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then I realized how much she was pooing and peeing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it was like, it's not that simple. And then you, you got to wash it. It's like, like it's, it's, it's nuts. And then I literally was the first day and I'm like, I'm not using these cloth diapers. Forget it. Or two boxes from Amazon. Like, I didn't even use them. It was a joke. I was just like, I cannot believe how much they poo and pee. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't a huge investment. It was like, Eighty dollars, and then obviously, if if I had actually stuck with it, and, and I would have saved more in the long run, but I just can't picture myself just doing it nonstop. It, it, it's, you know, the, the funny thing is at the beginning, like the poo is like pretty much liquid, so it's actually oh, not a big man. deal. But after they start eating real food, it's like, you know, normal poo. I know we've talked about poo for too long, but you know, that's just one <laughs> yeah, of the you just made this things. podcast R rated. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> it's just one of those examples. But even like you, you know, like I was telling you. Um, about anything to make the baby sleep. You know, we tried right. different sleep sacks, right. miracle blankets, uh, you, you know, sound machines, <laughs> anything you possibly could have done. And then, and a lot of those things, and it's always in hindsight, You, I realized I could have bought those things secondhand. Uh, Kijiji is huge in Canada. It's easy to source a lot of baby stuff. You, you know, I could go on right now and probably find 50 baby outfits for, for $10 Canadian, right? <laughs> and I probably, you know, had I bought that new, it would have cost me 200 to $300. So, so there are so many ways to save. Uh, but as a new parent, sometimes you just, your mind's not there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And is there a way to prepare? You're saying just buy this stuff ahead of time or have a plan ahead of time because these are things that you don't expect, but suddenly pop up. And like you said, it's like driving under the influence, right? <laughs> you're, you're sleepy. <laughs> you're tired. You don't it- really want to think about your money expenses at that point you're just like it it totally is right and then it's like and retailers have it set up these days now where it's like it's so easy to just buy it like obviously amazon prime like oh i can just have it delivered the next day i don't even need to leave it'll be delivered in the morning right (laughs) so it's it's uh it's a bit tricky and then you know i i say i made a lot of mistakes but at the same time we 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 made a lot of smart decisions too we really got back into the you know cooking our meals uh after just a couple of weeks, you know, some people go months before they even attempt to cook at home. But, you know, we had a good support system. And it's just, you know, it's just asking for help. There's nothing wrong with asking friends to help prepare meals, uh, especially mm-hmm. if they're offering it. Or, if you know, most people, most parents are happy to give away baby clothes. We have tons of baby clothes that we would give away to any friend right now who needed it. Because what are we going to do with it, right? Mm-hmm. She doesn't fit any of them anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you've talked about some of the things that you would redo if you had a chance um, now thinking as, as, as a father and as a parent. And if we maybe were to, to look even further back, you know, in, in the years that you've been writing about, about personal finance and blogging about it, I'm, I imagine that there are quite a few things that you've learned that had you known years prior, you wish you'd done sooner. Well, what are some of those mm-hmm. things? Um, you know, for me, one thing that stands out is just uh, knowing your employee benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, I was fortunate to work for a company that had a defined benefit pension plan. And for those who aren't familiar with that, it's basically a guaranteed income source when you retire. Um, but for me, I was also saving in RRSPs, which is another retirement savings vehicle in Canada. So I figured I didn't need this pension, mm-hmm. but also no one really explained it to me what it was. So Five years later, when I realized, like, no, it's guaranteed money and the company matches you. Yeah. Uh, and I was working for a big company where, like, you, you know, it was unlikely that they would default. So I literally gave up five years worth of c- contributions. And, you know, if you do the math, like, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot. Yeah. But when you factor in over 40 years, if I had stayed there, I'm no longer with the company, it could have been like eighty to to $100,000. Wow. <laughs> right it's it's nuts um, the but then math. other things yeah yeah people <laughs> don't realize how valuable stock plans are mm-hmm. uh, if you have them you know they, they're more concerned about hey getting that one dollar an hour raise but it's like 
your company is matching you, you know, I'm making this number up 25, 30, 50%, that's more valuable in the long run. Uh, so, so to me, it's those small things or, or another thing we talked about earlier is understanding fees and how they work, you know, 2.5% management expense ratio may not sound like much for a mutual fund, but again, compounded over 40 years, right. talking about tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Exactly. How have your finances changed now that you have uh, to think about Scarlett, now that you're a, a father? So and now, now that you have 14 months under the belt that you, you know, you have learnings from and lessons from. It's like an ongoing process. It's, it's weird. Um, you can always estimate certain things. So you you know when daycare came along, you know for in Toronto, I'm a major city, so it's actually really expensive. It's eighteen hundred dollars a month on average. Wow. Um, that's a huge chunk. You know that's a mortgage payment. There's a reason yeah. why a lot of people don't go back to work. Um, but it's kind of like those things where we we prepared for it on an ongoing basis by not buying that home that huge home like I discussed earlier. Right. Um, but it's also making other sacrifices. It's like, okay, we've got this daycare expense. Where do we cut back right. um, to pay for this? So we had to cut back on savings a little bit just because it was a huge amount. Um, we cut back on eating out a little bit, but we still eat out. It's not like we never eat out, but the point is we don't spend nearly as much as we did before. And even certain expectations. Right now we take a yearly vacation, uh, which is great, but if we had to cut back on it, we probably would, right? Right, because, because you know the baby is the priority, and there's other things to factor in also. You, you know, in Canada, there's an education matching program for the government right. for as far as post secondary education. So to me, that's free money, but we still got to find that money and set it aside. So it's really just reallocating our resources yeah. and seeing what's the best benefit to begin with, and then and then just spending what's left, right? Yeah, that makes total sense. And, and Barry, it sounds like you guys almost revisit your budget as each of these life changes happen. So as Scarlett, you know, is ready for daycare, it sounds like you sit back down and say, okay, where are we going to cut? How are we going to balance this budget? Yes. So that's a nice thing we've always done. We've always been uh, pretty good at budgeting. Uh, okay. We've got a spreadsheet where we just track it. And then whenever we got a raise uh, or a life event, then we updated it. So once, as soon as we found out Scarlett where we're going to have a baby, we started kind of cutting back a little bit to begin with. And then when my wife went on maternity leave, we calculated, okay, now we're on single income plus employment insurance. That's our new budget. And my wife just went back to work two months ago. So we redid the budget. Um, usually it's easier, but with the life event <laughs> with Scarlett, it was a bit trickier. Uh, but it's really not that bad when you think about it. Because like I said, it's really just reallocating your money. Because yeah. in the end, with an Excel spreadsheet, the numbers just balance themselves out, right? So you just mm -hmm. kind of need to see what goes where. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, you know, we often chat with couples about is the fact that when they're having their baby and they're taking maternity or paternity leave, there is a loss of income, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, that um, women have to get paid a little bit less. They, they in, in the U.S., they sometimes have to go on short-term disability um, or, you know, whether it's that um, parents, uh, fathers want to take some time off and they may not be supported through their employers. I'm really curious to hear how you guys approach that in your own relationship, given that your wife, it sounds like, Carla was was making less, you know, 40% of her income during that time. Yeah, so fortunately in Canada, my wife qualified for employment insurance. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was 40% uh, less. Um, but, you know, you look at an overall income, it's probably like maybe like a 30% decrease between the two of us total. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a huge hit. But at the same time, um, you know, I was already side hustling. So there was extra income coming in. So we were looking, it's not like we were purposely looking for ways to increase our income uh, because Carla's income would be decreased. Yeah, It just kind of happened that way. Uh, but to me, it really goes back to what I was saying earlier about how, how we did not buy that huge home. We knew that buying a huge home would affect our finances moving forward. And unfortunately, I do know couples who bought a big home, got their dream home, and as soon as they had their child, they realized that, oh, um, oh this is going to change everything. I can't take a vacation anymore. Daycare ha has to be grandma and grandpa because I can't afford daycare. Blah, blah. You know, I understand that I'm fortunate. We're fortunate that we can afford to put my child in, in daycare uh, without having to worry about it. But it's, you know, some of the decisions we made early on that allowed us to do this. Yeah, and that's, that's incredible is, you know, you've walked us through some of those decisions and there were forks at every stage. 
you know, when you're presented with such a large mortgage, you're right. Most people will say, wow, okay, I guess I can afford more house than I thought, but they really can't, right? It's how much the bank <laughs> is presenting them or giving them the opportunity to spend. And, and you decline that. And, and it's some of those early decisions that really, uh, that really helped you get to, to, to where you are today. And, and you could see how if someone makes the wrong decision at, at, at a fork opportunity, how it could lead to a completely different path. 100%. And it also goes, it's beyond just like those money decisions, specific decisions. You know, we talked about how my wife and had my, we had open discussions about money. So think about all those couples out there where one partner is just obsessed with getting that dream house and the other partner just gives in, right? Because they've never had those discussions or those open discussions. They're afraid of confrontation. Because we constantly had those discussions. We knew like, we don't want to affect our lifestyle. If that means a smaller home, that's fine. Right. Um, you know, we could care less of how other people judge us. And it's true, you know, we had family members judge us because yeah. it's like, you know, everyone's like, oh, I can't believe you bought such a small home. You can't raise a child in that home or right. I can't believe the location. You paid how yeah. much? Like everyone's going to criticize you in real estate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially when you live in a city like Toronto where real estate prices are, are incredibly high. I was just going to say that. I mean, sometimes it's it's a choice between a smaller home or a larger home. But sometimes for a lot of millennials, it's just a choice between a home at all. And, you know, in mm -hmm. San Francisco, for example, where we live, the, the cost of a one bedroom apartment is over half a million dollars. And, and that's really difficult when you don't have the ability to necessarily say, oh, OK, I'm going to take less. You know, I'm going to take what I actually can afford because you can't mm -hmm. buy a house with that sometimes. Um, so I totally understand why people make that decision, but you're absolutely right. The ramifications of that decision sometimes aren't felt until many years later when you're trying to do other things. Oh, yeah. And especially in Canada where uh, interest rates are low and we've got our mortgages are a bit different where our terms only last four or five years, depending on mm -hmm. what you get. Right. So, yeah, you know, two years ago when rates were low, everyone was buying, right? And prices right. can you, can you go up. But when their term is up in five years, well, interest rates have already gone up 1% since then. Right. So if you were already tapped out when you got the mortgage, it's even worse. well, you're going to be forced to pay more now, right? Like, yeah. like who, who knows what's going to happen? And these same people, they may have not started saving for retirement. You know, I, I take pride in being able to say that I'm saving for my retirement or I've got X amount saved up. And by having that kind of rough, plan in place it allows us to make smarter decisions because even though we talk about saving a lot of money i know i'm tracking to hit where i want to be at mm -hmm. a certain age mm -hmm. so if i spend a little bit more now i don't feel guilty because i know mm -hmm. it's not affecting anything long term right right um barry and our last and final question for you is sort of thinking about the future right like you think long term mm -hmm. about retirement but i'm curious as you guys think about potentially expanding your family for a second child how, how do you, now that you have the experience with Scarlett um, behind your belt, how do you guys uh, go about approaching that? Is it just taking the exact same approach that you outlined or has is anything changed in that planning? Uh, you know, it's tough. We talk about it. And then, you know, I talked about how daycare is so expensive. Yeah. And if we were to have another child, I honestly don't know how some people you know afford two kids right? right or like sometimes just there's we have one child and just you know the amount of stress the amount of work it is is like it's not even possible um <laughs> the truth is we haven't really thought that far ahead yet because as much as i like to think we're great planners you know having kids is expensive and people say oh it gets better when they're you know no longer in daycare but then other expenses come up you know there's after school or before school um programs that you need to put them in uh, you still got some. You still need some forms of childcare because you know schools might only be nine to three. Well, you know you got to drop them off before work and pick them up after. You got to figure that out. Um, you know soccer, t-ball, art classes. You know there's so many expenses that come up. Uh, you know my wife and I are fortunate that we earn a higher income, and it probably won't be a big deal, but. Definitely, there's going to be more sacrifices. A hundred percent, I can I can tell right now, we won't be doing those yearly vacations anymore. It just won't right. be possible, right. right? And and that's okay, right? You know, we're lucky that we did a lot of great experiences when we we're younger before we had a child, and that's and we have no regrets there, right? But you know, kind of need to see what happens, right? Yeah, man, paying for a second daycare alone scares me. So I, I totally understand uh, the decisions and the conversations that you guys must be having. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a bit terrifying at, at times. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I kind of, 
I know there's no real statistics, but I, I sometimes wonder, especially with, the, you know, you talked about real estate in San Francisco, uh, Toronto, and just millennials, the salaries aren't there. It'd be funny to see if there was like some new survey where all of a sudden like parents are having kids a couple years apart instead of like, you know, one or yeah. two, they're with three or four years because yeah. they're waiting for one child to get out of daycare before they have another. Yeah. Uh, um, like, you, you know, I know among friends, we talk about it. So, you know, if you're talking about it, you might be seriously be considering it. Like, I'm sure there's no real statistic, but I think people are thinking about it. Yeah. Well, Dummer's mom makes fun of us. She says we plan too much and that we should just go ahead and take the plunge and we'll be fine. Is sort of her, her approach. <laughs> I think she's just ready to be a, a grandmother, to be honest. <laughs> right. Well, I get that. That's fair enough. Right? Well, Barry, thank you so much for your time and for all this great insight. You know, we, like we said, couples are really curious to understand how to how to even tackle this idea of having your first kid and planning for them. And I think in, t in chatting with so many parents, the, the number one refrain I've heard is, oh, things were going great. And then we had our first kid <laughs> and things just went out <laughs> the window. So uh, getting your insight, some of the tactics you guys used and, and frankly, some of the lessons you've learned with Scarlett was super helpful. Happy to talk to you guys, man. I'm happy to share advice anytime. Oh, awesome. Barry, we appreciate it. Thank you so it. much. <laughs> no problem. The Money Date Podcast is an initiative of Zeta, a company that I launched to help couples track and manage their finances together. If you're inspired by what you heard on this show, you can learn more at ZetaHelp.com.